The voice of Husker Nation is on the air. This is Hale Varsity Radio. Insight, opinion, expertise, along with the biggest names talking Nebraska sports. Join in with the show at 402-489-1240 or 1-800-825-5865. Now, here are your hosts, Chris Schmidt and Elijah Herbal. Welcome to it. Monday is here. It's Hale Varsity Radio. We're presented by Currency for all your equipment financing needs. Go Currency. We are loaded up. Our dancing shoes are on. Sadly, not for Nebraska. We'll get there in a moment. Chris Schmidt, birthday boy, Elijah Herbal. I said, you 25? He's like, no, 24 today. So, happy birthday to you. Thank you, we'll sir. We'll spare you this song and dance. But uh, Connor Clark also in today. Numbers to get in, 489-1240. 489-1240. can also email the show, chris at hailvarsity.com. Catch the show not only uh, across the state with the different Hale Varsity affiliates, but also on the stream can watch and listen that way with the Hale Varsity YouTube channel. In the Hale Varsity Radio Twitter feed at H Varsity Radio. Give that a follow. Catch Andrew and Damon uh, weekday mornings with coffee and cream. Also part of Hale Varsity and uh, KFOR Facebook and Twitter. Guys, if you filled the bracket out, I, oh, I will spare you uh, the step by step. We are going to do a friendly wager. We got to decide what we are betting for the, uh, the three of us and to go from there, I'm sure. Uh, KFOR or uh, 590 or your different folks that uh, that that air us will have uh, their own station tournament challenge, some sort of fun way. But we've got to figure out something of substance to bet. We'll take suggestions into the Twitter inbox at HVarsity Radio, or uh, can also uh, send emails in. What do you want us to bet? Tattoo, shaved head. My firstborn child. Pink nails. I'll give you mine. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you mine. I'll we'll just call her good. Eh, Elijah beat me in the tournament. Junior, you're moving in with Elijah. <laughs> Have fun with that. But no, uh, excited. Uh, in about 20 minutes, uh, Coach Huffman from Bellevue West. He'll join us. We'll talk uh, some recruiting uh, with him. And uh, his program, Bellevue West, obviously super talented on the gridiron. Bellevue West, uh, incredible on the hardwood. Congratulations to the uh, now-retired Coach Woodard for Bell West winning the state championship this weekend in Class A. But a, a number of prospects for 2024 are playing football for Coach Huffman, one of which is quarterback making the commitment, um, uh, Daniel Kalen, going to Missouri. So we'll talk to Coach uh, Huffman about that process and some of the other uh, prospects that play for him that are headed down to Nebraska's junior day here towards the end of this month. So Coach Huffman in 20 minutes in hour two, Mr. Blackshirt, Charlie McBride, a Monday with Charlie. We'll talk some spring football as that is one week away. Coach McBride will weigh in on that. We'll do another segment of Ask Charlie. So get your, your questions into Coach McBride either through the stream or or on Twitter, or can email chris at halevarsity.com. If you have any questions for Coach McBride, we may or may not figure out his final four. And then uh, towards the end of our two, College Basketball Hall of Fame coach, four teams to the NCAA tournament, three, uh, three trips to the Sweet 16, and an Elite Eight, Tom Penders, Back with this, we'll get Coach Pender's take on the Big Ten. Uh, he hired Chris Beard as a student assistant at Texas. So Chris Beard is back in college basketball. Get his thoughts there. Also Nate Oates in Alabama, as I think a lot of the nation is uh, not down with either. Uh, a, that, that Chris Beard's back. B, that Alabama's the, the number one overall seed, and there's been no suspension or discipline to their star player. We'll get coaches' take on all of that, 489-1240, numbers to get in. But Nebraska basketball left at home even for the NIT, fellas. Let's start there. Listen, I, I was hoping for a Hail Mary or the half-court shot uh, from Tomanaga to hit in this instance. And, of course, last week, if that happens, Nebraska's probably – uh, a better shot to get in. You had North Carolina say, no, we don't do the NIT in Chapel Hill. 
Uh, Rutgers can argue got hosed. Maybe they did. Maybe they didn't. It's up to them to handle their business. They they didn't. And they are the uh, the, the ninth Big Ten team uh, to make it eight for the NCAA tournament. But NIT is uh, not part of Nebraska uh, this year. And it, it just opens up the question of what are we doing a year from now? What are we doing a year from now? Are we celebrating Nebraska making some sort of postseason? Are we talking about a coaching search? And I do not want that. I like Fred Hoiberg, and I hope Fred wins. 16-16, and considering the circumstances, far better than what it looked like even back in January as you had a 6-2 and February and uh, an okay March. You lost to Minnesota, but you beat Iowa. So does the roller coaster cease for Nebraska basketball? You've got a calendar year to get it figured out. You also lose two incredible pieces of this puzzle that made this season much more fun to watch than in past basketball seasons for the Big Reds. So uh, with Fred Hoiberg and Nebraska, no NIT guys will open the discussion up there. Not shocked, probably didn't earn it, needed to beat Minnesota. And uh, this is what you get. But overall, I think it's it's – it's been progress, and, and that's what I can say, and I'm not mad about the progress. It wasn't faked. It wasn't lucky. It was absolutely earned, and I think Fred's switch says a lot about him, and that's just kind of how you got to play ball in the Big Ten. Uh, you're going to have someone cut the nets down in Houston here in about three and a half weeks uh, because they can play defense, they can shoot threes, they can get up and down. Well, Uh, Nebraska's tried to play tempo. It hasn't worked. The commitment to defense wasn't there, and the shots weren't falling. This year, a lot of it came together. Derek Walker, incredible performance for him. Sam Greasel transferred to Nebraska, was big time for them. Tomanaga was who they scouted, and they got him to to live up to to what they saw on film, and, and he really had a great stretch run for him you've got some younger pieces nebraska fans are excited about and you brought in some transfers that were the right transfers in 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 bandamel and gary you you, you hope to get gary back what happens with some of the other guys uh uh, you have uh some some of the young players were were waiting uh ramel lloyd's ramel lloyd's where i was trying i was trying to come up sorry i was spitting out ramel lloyd you're excited about that Right. What time? Of, what type of jump does does um, uh, our our friend, uh, uh, as uh, Jabba called him lovingly, Rambus, Kurt Rambus, the uh, and I'm talking about. No, 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 you've lost me completely. I, I've lost you. Who reminds you the most of Rambus with crazy hair, beard, goggles? Wilhelm Brandenburg. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. What type of? That, that's the nickname that Jabba gave him. That's Rambus. So we're going to give the credit there. But what type of step does Breidenbach make? Can Keita stay healthy? Who sticks? Who stays? All these questions you, you got to sift through. But overall, I, I'm going to give Fred a, a, a B. You know, that's a hard, hard B from me. Uh, on a 16 and 16 season, but quite honestly, it, it could have, should have, would have been six to eight wins again, and they they overcame. Well, with the uh, the NIT in particular, let's start there. I don't think you can get disappointed if you don't get your hopes up. And with me, whenever Nebraska lost that game to Minnesota, I said, "Well, there's the NIT gone." Like, yeah, you, you knew you, we we knew it. Yeah, you, you knew just based on what that loss was, who Minnesota was coming into the Big Ten tournament. I think they were playing their best basketball of the season, but they still weren't good. The fact that you lost that game, the way you lost it, that's going to stick out in the, the oh. memory of people who are selecting the teams for the NIT tournament. That's going to stand out. Despite the fact that you beat two of the three Big Ten teams that are in the NIT, it doesn't matter if you lose a game to Minnesota in the way in which you did. So uh, I think once that loss happened, I kind of wrote off NIT altogether. I wasn't disappointed by any means last night. I thought we saw the end of the season. Um, and whenever you look at that season in totality, I'm kind of with Schmidt's B, and I think you have to look at it in two senses. First off, what Fred came into the year with, I think that should be uh, considered as a part of the, the coaching job. And I don't think he came in with enough talent 1 through 10 on the roster. I think 1 through 5 was fine. 1 through 10 on the roster, I think, is a little bit shaky. And I think you give him a C for what he's done in the past couple years, what he brought in this year. But once he finally got into the season, I think he created a system that worked for his starting five. He created a new system that worked well once he lost two members of your starting five. I have to give him 
probably a B plus or an A minus in terms of in season coaching. And mm-hmm. uh, you can't let the the stinker of a performance in the Big Ten tournament leave a bad taste in your mouth for what was at least in my opinion, a really good coaching job done by uh, Fred Hoiberg. So whenever you average out a B plus to A minus with a, a C, I think a B is a, a, a fair assessment of what Fred Hoiberg put together in 2022-2023. I think I'm going to go B plus here because just based on what Fred had to you know come up with, as you mentioned to Elijah, throughout the year, you had so many different lineups that you saw from this Nebraska team. And I mean – anybody in this room or anybody in the comments section who thought that Oleg was going to get minutes in a handful of Big Ten games coming into this year because I certainly didn't and the fact that they were able to concoct different lineups with no Bandamel, no Gary they had injuries on and off you know Greasel had his things Walker had his things early in the year we had no idea Tomonaga was going to be this good now obviously that says something about the talent that KC Tomonaga has, but it also says something about what Fred drew up to get him open because you see, they were running stuff for him literally every single time down the floor to get Tomonaga open. So I think that goes um, to the credit of Fred Hoiberg. His coaching job just schematically this year I thought was really, really good. Obviously didn't end the way that you wanted it to. And, you know, I agree. I think the loss to Minnesota was the straw that broke the camel's back when it comes to postseason hope. Obviously, once the selection show started for the NIT, my hopes just automatically rose right back up to the top, just leaving me for disappointment because I knew it was to come. But um, I I give Fred a B plus. The one thing that I think is just gut-wrenching now is to think about what could have been if, A, you win the first round of the Big Ten tournament, and then obviously the game that everybody's been talking about. What if you beat Purdue? And what is that? Do I'm going to add you? Sparty to that because you're, yes. you're up 15 on them. Mm-hmm. They're a seven seed that could either pack it in or or it's one of two ways. Does Sparty whimper out or do they get ticked off and do what they're supposed to do in March? Right. And if you don't roll over against Northwestern as well, I think that's a big one. Now, I know the game got out of hand quickly just because Ty Berry had a career night, which is something he normally does not do. I mean, that was his best game in college. But if you don't get steamrolled by Northwestern and maybe you keep it a little bit closer against Michigan on the road, I know they battled back multiple times in that game, but they never really got it under eight or seven. So Michigan was in control the whole it, time. It looked awful. They, I mean, they listen, they got drilled horribly. They got drilled at home by Northwestern. They got drilled at home by Illinois, both tournament teams. Mm-hmm. But you get beat at home by 20 plus. I mean, that's yeah. just that, 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 that is a. Uh, beware of dog <laughs> sign okay and then and then even I mean, look how look how inconsistent michigan is this year right i mean howard had some talent they still didn't deliver their 17 and 15 i mean people are ticked off at ann arbor and and they got drilled up there they had three bad 20 three bad 20 plus point losses okay and two of the three were were at home they righted it they figured it out uh, they split with Penn State, who's pretty hot. They swept Iowa. They beat Creighton. Wisconsin's another bubble team they beat. They uh, there's Memphis, obviously, just won uh, America Conference. So their their schedule was good. I like what Fred had the guys ready to play for. And that North uh, that uh, St. John's matchup early in the year, while it was so hard to watch, it got them prepared and they learned from it later on in the year with pressure. Well, yeah. I, I think two things can be true. One is that... Nebraska's resume was not good enough to make the NIT when you look at it objectively. I can see why they were left out. But also, at the same time, I think the talent and what this basketball team became at the end of the year would have made them a lot better than a lot of teams that are in the NIT. And it's okay that Nebraska, I don't think they would have been, had they made it in, the worst team in the NIT. They were on that 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 first four they, out they, type they, list of they, the NIT. They, 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 are a, they are a dangerous team. I, I, I think in the they, league yes. would, would have said that. I think they were... Talent-wise, as good as some of those seeded teams, the NIT, but also based on a resume, I don't think it was a wrong decision to leave Nebraska out. Your resume is important this time of year. It's not just about how you finish the year. Your whole body of work is important, and Nebraska didn't have the whole body of work to make the NIT. And I I think both of those things can be true at the same time. Yeah, I agree. I think that the resume wasn't there, at least in the win column. Now, the schedule was there, and uh, again, I'm I'm glad you brought up Memphis, too, Schmitty, is like... What happens if you pick off a couple of games down in Orlando early in the year? That was a good tournament when you look yes, back at it, it because 
Oklahoma's in a really good Big 12. They beat some really good teams. Obviously, you mentioned Memphis just winning the American tournament. So that's just another kind of question mark, what if, but I agree. I don't think the you know resume was there in the win column. And you know you have to value wins, but you also have to value losses at this time of the year as well. And I think that you saw that with Nebraska. Uh, I hate to go this route. I think you saw that a little bit with Rutgers yesterday as well being mm-hmm. left out. Um, you could make the argument both ways there, but I agree. I think you have to look at the entire body of work. The 6-2 and two February is great and all, but that doesn't discount, say, I don't remember the exact record, but like a 1-6 and six January. So... It was not good in January and March. You got to go two and zero oh, or two and one. I should say you got to play a second day in Chicago. Yes, uh, good question from Nick. You can submit your questions and comments. Uh, we'll put those up here on the stream as well. Uh, yes, Nebraska dangerous to themselves and others uh, a lot this season. But do you think if Chucky and, and Hunter were here, they'd be a tournament team? I think they need a seven footer. Derek did great work, and, and Nick, thanks for the submission against bigger bigger folks so uh while it'd be nice to have uh, zach Eady, uh it's not always mandatory because Derek played and was a was a handful to deal with uh even though he's uh, going up against taller folks it'd be nice to say yeah if chucky's here that's 15 points a ball game that you get but i think sam grease will fit this team better from a point guard position this year than, than chucky would have and that's hard to say considering he's playing on a different basketball team with different development. We'll talk some recruiting next. Coach Huffman from Bellevue West on the way. And now. And now, back to Hale Varsity Radio. Thanks for spending time. It's Hale Varsity on Monday. More thoughts on the dance, the brackets, and we'll even maybe get Coach McBride's tournament picks. He'll make him wear mouthpieces and helmets, but he, he's all about it. Charlie McBride in 40 minutes. We welcome in a tremendous coach with Bellevue West football. And uh, Mike Huffman joins us here on Hale Varsity. Coach, thanks for a few minutes. Uh, appreciate you joining us. How are you? Hey, it's been a, been a good day, man. Uh, pretty exciting for Bellevue West football. Proud of Daniel. Yeah, we were going to start there and uh, talk uh, Daniel Kalen as uh, Bellevue's uh, super talented quarterback is uh, off to Missouri. Coach, take us a little bit through the the, the recruiting process, uh, your involvement here, and, and, and really another incredible Metro quarterback going uh, going outside of Nebraska, which is, which is becoming more common. Well, you know, uh, you know, quarterback's a very, very difficult position, you know, because, you know, most classes, they only take one. Um, and it's a very unique, unique year uh, with what's going on with Nebraska. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, when you have one of the top recruits in the country, uh, Dylan Rayola in the mix, and then you also have guys like Daniel. Um, so the guys really have to go out, and they gotta, they got to search around. And these guys are at the, at the national level. They do do a lot of traveling. Daniel's been throwing – uh, in California for, for a couple years now. He goes down to Kansas City. He's done the Elite 11 stuff. He's done the QB Collective. And he's got to meet a lot of people. And, you know, his, his opportunities to, to see some different schools. And he's, he's done it right. You know, his mother, Teresa, has got him around where he needed to go. And he's got to meet some folks and spend a lot of time with them. And I just know he really, really felt comfortable with the men at Missouri. Let's talk about their offense, their system, and his fit. What what do you project? I know he still has time with you, but at the next level. You know what's really interesting, and and I was I was as an outsider looking in, like I I, I tell the kids some things that they need to look for as far as depth charts, and you know where in the country is it? Can your family see you play and things like that? But man, the the world of college football recruiting is so crazy. So Daniel has multiple offers, and there is. There was so much change, whether it be between coordinators or, or, or quarterback coaches, that many of them were different. So this Missouri situation, I was really interested to watch unfold. Now, Coach Drinkowitz has been amazing since the very, very beginning. But the guy that did most of the recruiting for Daniel, uh, his name was Bush Hamden, and recently he was the quarterback coach. He took the offensive coordinator position at Boise. So a new gentleman came in, uh, Kirby Moore is his name, and he's from this uh, Caleb DeBoer tree, mm. you know, who was at uh, with Tom Allen at Indiana for a while, and then he went to Fresno as a head coach, and now he just got done up at uh, up at Washington. Now this guy learned that offense, and as you know, 
studying college football, that Washington offense this year was just insane. So I'm 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 interested to see that and how it how it forms and takes shape and uh, Missouri under over under under Coach Moore and see what it does in the SEC. But now Daniel, he's so cerebral. He's got a great arm. He has really worked on his mobility. You know, he's not a runner. But he can run if he has to to get that, you know, extend the sticks on a third down or, or maybe get you into a situation, a more manageable fourth and short or something like that. So I'm excited to see what they do with him. Well, you'd mentioned that DeBoer tree. And, yeah, he was him paired with Penix, uh, not only in Indiana, but that, that this last year at Washington. And then even seeing him, this is way back in the day when he was at, at the University of Sioux Falls, I believe, is where mm-hmm. he was at just – just crushing everybody. I think he went like 99 and two or something like that. So DeBoer's tree in that match with what Missouri wants to do is, is fantastic. Let's talk uh, some attributes from, from Daniel since you're with him every day and how he's able to rally uh, an offense, rally a team, the, 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 the super important trait of leadership to go along with that skill. Well, Daniel's a very positive young man. Even when when things aren't going, you know, the way you want him to in a football game, he's he's always got that belief that he can get something cooking. You know, with that that big, strong right arm. It, it seems like every day I joke with him, man. Are you growing? Or have you gotten taller? <laughs> he really looks like a collegiate swimmer. He's got big, broad shoulders, narrow waist, long legs, but he just believes in himself. And you know, he he has known our offense. You know. We pulled him up right away. He didn't spend any time with the ninth graders. He went right straight to our, our JV. So he's been with us on the varsity offense the whole time. It's almost like having another coach in there. And so I add those things to him and, you know, let him, he has free reign to change plays when he needs to and do all those types of things. So, uh, you know, you have some talent around him. You got guys like Devon Hall and Isaiah McMorris. You know, that helps because, you know, people can't double those guys. And man, he's just so doggone accurate. You know, he's going to put it, put it in a spot where only our guys can catch it, and if they don't catch it, it's going to be incomplete. That was probably his biggest area of growth last year to begin the season. He was taking too many chances, and once he uh, simmered that down, we really took off. Coach Michael Huffman with us here on Hale Varsity Radio. And, Coach, before we get to the guys like uh, Davon Hall and, and McMorris, quickly, I want to talk about the fact that you're sending him off to an SEC school. And that even feels weird to say still, however many years removed we are from Missouri leaving the Big 12. But how important do you think is that going to be moving forward? You have a lot of big-time recruits that come through Bellevue West. How important is the SEC or, or the Big 10 going to be moving forward as it starts to really come about that there's going to be two major conferences in this country? Yeah, I, I'm interested to see how that plays out as well. I, I will tell you from talking to Daniel, uh, it wasn't so much that it was the SEC. There, there were some factors in there. He really liked Eli Drinkowitz. The fact that you know he does have family in Missouri. It's, it's the closest uh, school that he had a high amount of interest in. Um, I'm interested to see because you know I read all that stuff about the conferences and things too, and it just seems like there's so much money in the Big Ten and the SEC. Will there be a bigger gap created? What's going to happen with the Big Twelve? I click on about every other article I can to see who the you know I saw the one about adding the four corners to the to the Big Twelve, and you know it's just it's you know when you grow up around here, I still think of the old Big Eight for goodness sakes. That's how old I am, and you know the games against Missouri and Colorado and to see how it all unfolds. But I don't know that right now the kids are really thinking that way. I think they'll think more of that probably in, in the two years when like when Oklahoma and Texas leave for the SEC and all that stuff really, really start shaping out. Then I think it's going to be a bigger deal. Coach Hoffman, a, a thought as we look towards uh, some of your, your other High-level guys, uh, really awesome team you've continually, continuously put together, but with Isaiah McMorris and Davon Hall, the whole world's recruiting them. I want to get your response and take on on Coach Rule and just what Nebraska's done in the Metro. They've not been here long, a little over 100 days uh, last week with Coach Rule's press conference, but Nebraska's made a, a pretty big-time effort to to knock on a lot of doors and make connections in state. How's how's that been received by you and other uh, other coaches in state? Well, you know, in all honesty, we, we've been taken care of pretty good from, from all the staffs. Uh, you know, Coach Riley was up there quite a bit. Coach Frost came a few times. Uh, so, we, you know, we, we're probably not the best ones to ask her because we have had a number of 
uh, high-level players each year. Now, one thing I will tell you, Coach Rule and his staff, they're different now. They, they, they're like – they're just good dudes. You know, for, for example, obviously I'm at Bellevue West. My wife teaches at Bellevue East. She's a foods teacher. And, you know, recruiting gets pretty hectic around our place. I always joke it's a blessing and a curse. You know, obviously we have good enough players that people are coming. But, man, every waking hour, this isn't Texas. I have to teach, right? I have stuff to do during the day. So you're, like, working every nook and cranny to get these coaches in to see the kids. And we're at the breakfast table. I got a fourth and sixth grader, and we spend some time every morning you know, talking about what's going on. And Lori's like, well, who's coming today? I said, well, Coach Rule's coming up. She goes, Michael. And I didn't tell her, and she has always made cookies. Don't you tell these other coaches this stuff, but she always makes cookies when the Huskers come to the house. <laughs> and she, you know, she's a, life, she's a lifelong Husker, too. And uh, so she literally gets to work at Bellevue East, makes cookies, red and white M&Ms, drives them over during her lunch so they would be there oh, for Coach Rule and Coach Foley when they get there. Well, they stay. It was awesome. Great visit. They're there for probably way too long. Then they had to pop into other school. They go to Bellevue East, and not once, but twice, they kept telling Coach Tooman that I've got to go thank Miss Huffman for these cookies. He took time to her classroom in person to thank. Then fast forward to the beginning of February, they're up here speaking for the Metro Clinic. Again, think of all the hundreds of people that Matt Rule has met since he's been here in his hundred days, he walks right up when I walk in, gets through his phone, and shows me the picture of the cookies he took. I mean, this, that dude, that's that's different, guys. That ain't usually how it is. That that so is. I sure, I sure hope it translates to the field. Cause you sure, I mean, I, I'm drinking all this red Kool Aid. I'm with you, man. I'm hoping it you know plays out in some dubs coming the fall because it's fun when the Huskers are winning. It is, and let's talk about uh, Davon and and McMorris. Coach, sifting through their mail, their traffic, their visits, uh, your your involvement and in specifically just the, the voice of reason you can provide or uh, just that, that experience you have because this isn't the first time you've had uh, big-time coaches on your doorstep. Yeah. You know, and those are the, those are the conversations that I have with the kids. Like, I, I don't ever, you know, try to encourage them to go anywhere because the way I look at it, if – if I pushed them to go somewhere and it didn't work out, mm-hmm. then I would feel bad about that. Sure. So, you know, I encourage them, you know, you, you can't fall in love with your position coach because, man, those guys leave so much, it's unbelievable. And they don't even give you any head start. But, you know, I, I'll talk to these coaches and, you know, I'll, I'll tell them the good, the bad, the ugly about the kids. And then the kids got to get there and they got to, can you see yourself going to school there? What's the feel in the locker room? Did you get a good vibe out of it? All, all the facilities are amazing anymore. But I'll tell you the biggest piece of advice I'm giving the kids nowadays, and I, I, I don't even remember if it was Coach Fuchs from Kansas or Coach Riley from Kansas State or whatever. It's like, make sure these kids don't wait around too long because the transfer portal has really hurt high school recruiting. So if you have options – you need to take them, you know. So, you know, as you saw, Daniel, he, he pulled the trigger already because, you know, he wants to help Missouri with their class. I have encouraged both Devon and Isaiah to get their visits, get their visits done here in April and then make their choice. You can't wait around because there's just not that many spots left. And they fill up, and we've learned that from some of our kids waiting around for a bigger offer. And then they were, I don't want to say they settled because anytime you're going to college for free, that's awesome. I would sign up for that right now. I'll probably cut off the toe to get my kid to school, you know, for free. Uh, but we don't want those kids to wait and miss out on an opportunity. So I'm, I would look to see those two guys make their choices probably in late April or early May. Uh, coach Huffman with us, Bellevue West head football coach. It's Hale Varsity Radio. Coach, we're up against a hard break. Can we keep you a couple of minutes on the other side? Do you yep. have time? Is that all right? Great. Yep, you bet. Hang- Head to Mexico tomorrow, so today's a good day. That is awesome. Ooh. Good for you. A little spring break. I love spring I, break. I love that. Yes, sir. Hang on. Hang on, Coach. We'll be right back with you. Hale Varsity, we're talking about uh, Daniel Kalin's commitment to Missouri. Uh, so you've got uh, back-to-back High-level Metro quarterbacks not in Lincoln. Uh, Coach uh, Huffman laid out the Nebraska situation and then spent a little time there on on, on, on Hall and McMorris. We'll talk a little more here with Coach Huffman on Hale Bar. And now. And now, back to Hale Varsity Radio. A couple of minutes uh, on the other side here with Bellevue West head coach Mike Huffman. 
Coach, thanks for hanging on through and uh, enjoy Mexico, man. It's it's going to be nice, like two days here on the eastern part of the state, and then not so much Nebraska Springs. So you're going to get some sunshine. That sounds like a lot of fun. Well, I tell you what, I need it with these old bones. All those years of spring baseball, and then you have the <laughs> cold falls, man. I need that sun on my face. <laughs> no, you are right. We are we are gearing up for for spring base, baseball in my household. So the uh, the heated vest and the hoodie sweatshirts are still within arm's yeah. reach. And I was looking at the forecast for the next couple of weeks at home, so I bought myself a brand new uh, big umpire's coat for this ah, year. Uh, no, there we go. It's not going to be cold in the bases this time around. Balls and strikes. There we go. <laughs> Coach, uh, real quick, just speak to the, the the talent acknowledgement in the state that, that's gone on, and your program's always had a lot of national programs come in to recruit your kids, but more and more Nebraskans are seeing – uh, all sorts of places, not just Nebraska recruit. Touch on how the talent level is either getting noticed or on the rise. You know, I think there's a lot of factors that play into that. I'm just so happy because, you know, these kids deserve the opportunities. And for years, you know, for right, wrong, or indifferent, the, if the Huskers didn't offer, then other schools weren't interested. Now they're to the point where they don't even wait anymore. Uh, I don't know if it's, you know, Huddle makes things really easy with being able to put your film together and get it sent out. Uh, you know, the coaching tree is small, it seems like. There's someone that started at Nebraska or started at Iowa or Kansas or Kansas State, and they know the area is good. And so they keep dipping back in. Um, I do I do like the growth of the seven-on-seven. Seven. Now, I look forward to the day where it's like AAU basketball and there's live evaluation periods because, you know, those those basketball kids, they you know, you got Coach Krzyzewski or Coach Hoiberg or whoever is sitting there courtside watching kids play. And seven-on-seven seven is not like that yet, but there's enough reporters there where they, they hire them guys and they, they get their reports. I can't wait for that. Uh, the track times, you know, I was talking about it years ago, but a 10-8 here is a 10-8 in Georgia. And so they want to see those things. So I'm just proud of the schools uh, that are coming in and giving these kids chances. They had a chance to just small world. We're playing for the state basketball title on Saturday, and Danny had made it back from Missouri already, and he was super excited. And he's with this just unbelievable-looking kid. I'm like, who are you? And he's the Carter kid from the Ainsworth, the eight-man yes. kid. yep. Holy good looking drink of water. That kid's gonna make someone really happy. I couldn't I mean, it's the just the way these kids are growing, they're bigger, they're faster, they're stronger. And I, I honestly think that you know, I think coaches are doing a better job of, of teaching them and coaching them. I think there's a lot of good side guys out there. I know John Teaglin has worked m- just miracles with Danny Kalen. He sent out a really good tweet today. You know, Danny's been working his craft since he's like in fifth grade. And, and John, I don't know if he just saw it early, but he's got pictures and he, he released a tweet today. You'll have to look it up. It's really cool just seeing like the development over the years. But I think coaches are, you know, both the high school coaches and private coaches and the seven on seven coaches are all just getting along better, which is in the end, it's good for kids. You know, it, there used to be too many egos in my opinion. And I'm glad those things have went away way but and also props to the college coaches are coming in and giving these kids chances coach a uh, thought on on Xavier Betts back with Nebraska and uh and how how you think he can mesh with with rule and uh the, the direction the program wants to go under rule I'm so happy man you know I'm a big Xavier Betts fan you know he, he had a he had a road that he had to hoe and he kept at it and Gosh, yeah, he started off so good down there, and I, I don't know what happened, where it went awry, but that was one of the first things I asked Coach Rule when he came in to sit down. I go, you know, tell me how it's working with Xavier, and he goes, you know, he just got had everybody he talked to down there. Well, this kid, this, this kid, that, and and Matt's like, he's like, these are the kids, these are the challenges that I like to save, and I'm just so happy. I've I've messaged him a few times, and he is. He seems to be doing so well because Xavier, he is such a likable kid, mm-hmm. such a likable kid. And like you know, he's he's really quiet. He's not an arrogant kid. He just he wouldn't even know he was a superstar if you didn't know. So I'm just so thankful they got him back and he's on the right track. He he had a great winter. You know, I saw the report last week that he's gained a bunch of weight and you know he's faster than he's ever been. I just can't wait to see what he does over the next what three four weeks of spring ball. And thankful for Coach Rule that that have that personality because some of these 
some of these college coaches are more like mercenaries. You know, they're trying to find the right pieces. They don't fit. They kick them out. You know, so I'm, I'm pumped that they reached out. They found him. Um, and I, I want to see it because you always want your old players, you know, to do well. But, you know, after they get away from you, that bird flies away. There's only so much you can do. So I'm happy he's found another guy to – help him get back in that mess. So I, I want to see him tear it up. Sounds like he might be changing numbers, so that'll be weird for me, though. Going from, from right, what to playing. going, what, 15 to what? I don't know. He doesn't know yet, but he said 15's already taken. So I'm like, because I said something, I'm like, I can't wait to see 15 flying down the sidelines again. He goes, Coach, I think it got to change. My number's gone. I'm like, oh, thanks. <laughs> oh, well, still, still the scarlet and cream, baby. Still the scarlet and cream. Coach Michael Huffman's with us here. It's Hale Varsity Radio. And, Coach, quickly, before we get you out, i got to ask you about Bellevue West, the basketball program. They finish an undefeated season on Saturday, taking down Miller North in the state title game. And, oh, not to mention Coach Woodard going out on top as he retires after one of the best coaching crews we've seen in Nebraska high school state basketball. A thought on Coach Woodard and a thought on that basketball program. You know, Coach Woodard, you know, I'm not going to lie. I might even have a couple tears. I know my wife did have some tears. He is he is such an amazing human being. Uh, I've been in it for 25 years. And not only is he obviously an incredible basketball coach, but he is the best dean of students I've ever been around. His ability to be stern with high school kids but not mean is absolutely masterful. And, and he's able to to stand by what he believes in all these years uh, he's wonderful with those kids, what he expects of them. And what's one of the first things when I, when I got to West in 2013, we worked out separate. And, you know, C.J. Johnson and Malik Huluchiweki were my first two studs at West. And Max didn't get them to go to any of my stuff because they're all so afraid of Coach Woodard. They all went to his stuff. So, well, that's things for the football coach. So I have made quick to make buddies with Coach Woodard. And since then – our football skill kids and the basketball kids work out together in the summer. And any, anybody that ever asked how we did this at Bellevue West, that's the first thing I tell them. He's like, you got to make buddies with the basketball coach because those are the kids that run the ball and you want to throw the ball to. And it's been the best decision. But he will be missed, man. I was texting Phil Woodard uh, actually just yesterday because I, I just the building is going to be so different. And I'm not even talking about basketball-wise. That's obvious. He's a legend. I always call him the Wizard of West. But man alive, his presence is going to be missed. He's just an excellent, excellent human being. Well, Coach Huffman, enjoy Mexico. Continue to to do what you do, and that's uh, uh, teach and coach uh, great young men. And and thanks for a few minutes with us today on Hale Varsity. Hey, thanks for having me, fellas. Take care. There he is. Coach Huffman joining us here on Hale Varsity. Good insight as he's had – uh, a bunch of dudes that uh, have uh, played high-level ball, but uh, big picture, he's done a great job of, of caring for and, and teaching kids the right way. So we wanted to get his take not only on Kayla and his quarterback down in SEC country, but still feels weird to say. Oh, you're telling me you got to pause a second. Uh, no, 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 they're not Big Twelve. They're that's right. They're 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 SEC now. But hey, can we please get the Missouri Nebraska Bell back? That was one of the best rivalries that's gone away in college football. Just my quick. Three second soapbox there. Well, you, the Missouri Nebraska. You're ball. good. You're good. And you, you know, you've got all sorts of shake up potentially down the road. Thanks to Coach Huffman. That'll be on the podcast, Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, Hale Varsity. To wrap, wrap up hour one. Now. And now. And now. Back to Hale Varsity Radio. Thanks for spending time. Uh, full interview with uh, our friend Coach Huffman, Bell West. Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, where you go and uh, find that uh, with the Hale Bar City Radio podcast. Big thanks to him before he heads to spring break land. Good on him, man. Getting into some warm, some warm weather. Reminder to uh, to get buckled up. Eyes and mind straight ahead. Your job, one job, that's to drive and uh, keep your Hands on the wheel and uh, that seat belt buckled up. A message from the Nebraska Department of Highway Safety Office. What are we betting? You're 21 now. You just turned 24 today. It's all things go now. Are we? Are we? <laughs> are we Watch are yourself we, with that. <laughs> yeah. Are we betting a bottle? Is it uh, oh. a gift card? What do we need to do here for the bragging rights for the uh, the uh, the Hale Varsity Radio Afternoon Show? 
What do you want? You want a six pack uh, Natty Light? I mean, is that the wheelhouse you're in here as a oh, newly I'm not minted, that cheap. Come on. newly minted 21 year old? <laughs> I, uh, Elijah, are you a McCormick's vodka guy? Me, I mean, are we just going to go with uh, some I, Tito's? Come on. I like I like the bottle p- proposition. I think that's a good one. Okay. Loser has to buy it for the winner. Whoever get, finishes third among us three has to buy it for number one. Yeah. I assume the way it goes. And, was, and number two gets off scot free. No, I think I think the the loser has to buy for one and two. <laughs> oh, if you lose one and two, yeah. Ooh, now you're getting so it's more about so it's more show, about not losing rather than winning. Right. <laughs> okay. Lyde's gonna show up here with some apr- airplane bottles of vodka. <laughs> so you said a bottle, technicality. Well, according to my mind, I think I open up as the favorite minus two fifty for this competition. Oh wow! So. <laughs> look at look at Connor. <laughs> well, I'm, do you have your final four done? Oh no. Uh, okay. You know, I, see, I will I, soon though. I was <laughs> hoping we get into this uh, into this conversation here, and I'd get a little insight from my bracket. So he might not be wrong. <laughs> no. How many of you won? Like, you're. you're um, did you win the high school bracket? Have you you have you won two years at UNL? Do you do you usually place pretty well, or are you usually? Yeah, last, last year was horrible. Yeah, last year might have been my worst year, just because I had Kentucky winning at St. Peter's just ruined it from from sure. day one. So, um, I I think this year will be better than last year, but obviously. The season has just been so unpredictable. You had about three teams rotating and changing spots. Yeah. We'll hear from Tom Penders here in about 30 minutes. His take on the tournament, his take on Fred Hoiberg, Chris Beard back in college basketball, his uh, grad assistant that got brought into the world of college basketball by Tom Penders, uh, bat down at Texas, and then uh, also, of course, reaction with Nate Oates in Alabama. Uh, Roll Tide is your number one seed overall. There's a lot of folks around the country that are anti-Alabama anyway because of football, but they're super anti-Alabama because of what's going on with Bama basketball. Well, I think they deserve the one seed, but we all know like the, the, the backstory behind Alabama. That's going to be a cloud that hangs over that program throughout the entire NCAA tournament, and I wonder if it comes back to bite them. I think you could... I may be in the minority of this year. Obviously, the Alabama situation, we all know about it. And they're, they're still very deserving of a one seed. I think the one seed, and I don't care that they just lost to Texas by 20, is Kansas. They have 17 quad one wins. I know you value the losses as well, but 17 quad one wins is pretty hard to ignore. Okay, my bold prediction for the day, I do think your champ comes out of the West. Kansas, UCLA, Northwestern, uh, uh, Northwestern, and Gonzaga all in that West. That West is stacked. I think your eventual champion comes out uh, iron sharp and iron. I think that's what's going to happen in the West bracket. We shall see. We'll talk some football. Ask Charlie. Get your questions in. Chris at HaleVarsity.com. Coach McBride. Night. The voice of Husker Nation is on the air. This is Hale Varsity Radio. Insight, opinion, expertise, along with the biggest names talking Nebraska sports. Join in with the show at 402-489-1240 or 1-800-825-5865. Now, here are your hosts, Chris Schmidt and Elijah Herbel. Thanks for hanging out. It's Hale Varsity Radio Hour 2. We're presented by Currency. For all your equipment financing needs, go Currency. Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal, Connor Clark, as we welcome in Mr. Blackshirt, Charlie McBride. We'll get to some of your Ask Charlie questions in a little bit. And uh, we say hi to Coach McBride. Coach, do you have your, uh, your bracket printed off for the NCAA tournament? How are you doing? Did we lose him? Maybe. I'll double check. Coach, do we have you? Hello. Give I'll the, give, give the phone a little jiggle. Sometimes the phone gets stuck. Coach, uh, third time the charm, do we have you? We'll reconnect. Okay, we'll go fix that. So that makes me sad. That's the, uh, the build up. <laughs> the, uh, the phone lines here around this building do, in fact, do that. The so. blown coverage. It's <laughs> a good way to put it. Right now, Coach is like, who's. Trying to get a hold of me. No, I love you, Coach. We'll uh, be back with you in just a moment. So, Coach McBride will join us. But this has been fun the last couple of weeks anyway with Ask Charlie. The uh, spring the spring session is is on hold. And then we're, uh, we're ready to go 
with um, with Spring Ball a week from today. Yeah, and still time to get you some of your questions in here for the Ask Charlie segment as I see Connor reconnecting over in the studio. At Herbal Essences for me, at Schmidt underscore radio for Schmitty, and at C underscore Clark 27. Give us your questions for Charlie, and I think we're back. Coach, we have you now. Uh, how are we doing? Oh, I'm having fun. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah, it sounds like it. I'm just waiting for you to come back to talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am so sorry about that. Uh, you're like, where am I? Where am I? What's happening? Phone line issue on our part. So thanks for your patience, Coach. Have you uh, oh. dove in yet to, to your NCAA tournament picks? Do you do a tournament bracket with family and friends every year? Well, I usually do, but since I've been out here, you know, I, I've been busy and uh, – you know, going around, I went to talk to a couple of the, I think about six or eight of the kids that I coached here at ASU for lunch the other day. And, awesome. And so I've, I've been talking with John Reinhardt, a good friend of ours. Mm-hmm. And he played at Nebraska, and he lives out here. I spent some time with him and, and uh, so and some other people that I knew out here. We got, they got a big, big Husker club out here. It's uh Huskers N, it's called mm-hmm. Huskers N Arizona, and uh, they probably have three or four hundred people involved in it. Now, Charlie, from your story, you told us a couple weeks ago about uh, that week that you were a betting insider and you were investigated by the FBI. I got to get your take. <laughs> Who do you have winning it all this year? You, you can really help me in my bracket because I don't want to lose. <laughs> hey, look at I have to look at that thing because usually I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> We gotta re, we gotta rephrase I, I that. Even, I haven't even seen it, to be honest with you, and uh, I haven't I haven't even looked at a TV or anything. You know, you get out here, you're outside all the time. Yeah, because so it's... I haven't even really looked at it. So you know, you have to give me a break there. But uh, <laughs> I, you know, I don't I don't know it. You know, sometimes when you have a year where you don't know. It's usually some team that comes up all of a sudden in, during the tournament mm-hmm. and gets hot. You know, I I remember some of the smaller schools in the past, you know, have done it. And, um, you know, and people just sit there and can't believe it, and it happens. And that that, that, that tournament can turn into crazy people, you know, and mm-hmm. – it's it's really it really to me is a is a great tournament. That's Charlie saying the FBI could use this as evidence. You're getting nothing out of me. <laughs> <laughs> well, they they can contact him, and uh, it was uh, not a not an intentional deal. Charlie McBride's joining us here. I have been kicked off uh, camera here, so we'll uh, we'll deal with that. <laughs> but coach, it, Nebraska has a, a week to to chill out, and then they're going to get after it. With spring football, one of the questions that came into us: What's your reaction when Coach Rule says the most important thing we can do is practice? That's his emphasis as the guys get ready to go this spring. He's really, really focused in on practice, on confidence development, on on drilling to uh, to get ready. Well, what he's going to do, I think, is find out run the type of drills and things so they're going to find out who the best people are. Mm-hmm. That's, that's where they have to make a decision because they haven't, they haven't been around these, you know, they've been around the kids inside, but it, it, some of them are a little different outside. Some of them are a little better than they thought they were, and, you know, from the inside part. Um, you know, that maybe that the guys, especially where you find guys that don't test quite as good, Mm-hmm. maybe on some of the things they're doing that get outside all of a sudden they look at them and even though they don't test that good they're really good players charlie mcbride's with us here on hail varsity radio they are doing a, a a full assessment they've also got to get the roster numbers down coach how are you able to confidently well i guess the better way to put this is what's the the timeline how long do you give a guy to pop before not necessarily you move on from him but you start looking elsewhere for answers with some positions of need you know it's really funny how how some players react i mean i've been in a position where i've told players that they 
probably weren't going to play at all, and they'd basically just be on the scout team if they wanted to stay. They're welcome to stay. You know, if not, we'll, and you want to go on and play football, we'd be more than happy to, you know, to help you out and find a place for you, you know, and uh, most of the time it would be something in state, but, you know, there can be other schools, but I mean, we did it. The in-state people were really ready to pick up some of our players and they did. Uh, Jason Light, for example, who's the you know the general manager John of the, of the Bucks, is mm-hmm. was a player that I think and that was in that category. Later on, as he got, he played a couple years and then I think he moved on down and went to another school. And you know it worked out good for him. It was here in Lincoln, and he played. And it was I think he ended up being captain. And um, and but he came over and lifted at the, you know, at the university with all the guys that he started out with. So mm-hmm. there's all kinds of things. And some kids just want to go to school. You know, they tried it. They and they have in their minds that if I make it, you know, that's all the better. But if I don't, I'm not gonna, you know, let it blow me up. I'm gonna stay here and get a degree. Coach Charlie McBride is with us here on Hale Varsity Radio. And to go along with what Chris just asked you, Coach, about the roster thinning out, the QB room has been something that we've talked about over the offseason. When do you expect that room to start thinning out and getting your top, well, say, five guys? What? Well, here's the thing. You know, we, we our testing program was something that, uh, that we had to cut down our walk-on program at one time. You know, we had, we were just had too many people, and Tom felt like we needed to, to get it changed and get, and some of the players we had. So we did set a, a, a score scores for the test. Mm-hmm. If they couldn't make those scores, then they they knew ahead of time that uh, you know they weren't going to be able to to play. It wasn't, it, and so it those things helped us get out uh, from under some of the kids that. You know that uh, that were here, and we were a little more lenient when it came to walk-ons at the time. Now, you know, then we had a change. We changed the program some, where we really, you know, had a no before they came by film and coaches' recommendations and things like that. Whereas in the past, they might just call up on the phone and say, "I want to walk on," and that 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 got us in a little bit of trouble numbers-wise. Mm-hmm. So they they can do it that way, you know. And I think by by saying that you're a, you you are uh, over, uh, a lot of players know it already and understand it, that if they don't uh, perform, that the chances are probably they're going to have to move on. A lot of players understand if I can't make it, you know, at Nebraska and I want to play big time football, that I'm just going to pass and and get my degree and go on with it and uh so that each kid has his own you know kind of his own philosophy of what he wants to do especially the ones that are the down maybe down the liners a little bit coach it's going to be a uh, a spring session where maybe guys and end, uh, end up changing positions mm. uh, there's uh, a lot of flexibility with this defense, and and it r- really reminds me of you and and the and the defensive minds just getting so much speed on yeah. the field when you'd switch to that four three in the early nineties. What's the trick? What's the secret <laughs> to having that chat with a guy? That all right, we really want you to play. We think you you can do well. How do you get that trust? <laughs> to be uh, where it needs to be to get him to switch spots. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I remember when we changed to a four-three. You know, we were in a, we were in kind of a five-man front basically, and uh, and and we stacked our backers sometimes. So you, you know, it might be a five-three instead of a five-two or something like that. And uh, but the idea, of the whole thing was our out. The biggest change was our outside linebackers. Who were always standing up, and uh, you know they had to put their hand on the ground now, <laughs> and uh, a lot of them became better players for mm-hmm. it, and because of the rush that I, we would call them rush ends, 
Um, we changed kind of our terminology a little bit uh, and made them think that it was, you know, more valuable, I think, by just saying you're an end or an outside backer. You're now an end. But we called them a rush end, and so that put them in the pass rush category. And a lot of them, uh, we we did some things with them, probably uh, more than you know a lot of people do um, with them. And I think it added to their, you know, they, their importance, and it added also to the fact that they enjoyed it more. Uh, they had more things to kind of uh, do, and I think uh, it. It turned a lot of guys, I think, you know, even Treb, if you talk to him about it, uh, I think you'll you'll see that, uh, you know, he went to one of the top rushers uh, back man in, in, in uh, you know, uh, in, in Nebraska. I mean, he's one of the top guys right now, I think, and still in record holding and things like that. So there are some guys, but it also gave us a chance the size wise, we re- you really didn't have to be a huge person. You had to be a guy that could really motor. I mean, you know, you had to be a guy that could really, you know, had speed, quickness, explosiveness. And, uh, you know, you, you were, you had to be an athlete, uh, probably a little more so because of the being the rush end part of it. Um, you know, as you know, in the NFL, a lot of those guys are six five, two sixty, or seventy, and can really move. And uh, Neil Smith would be put in that category, for example, and Trev was in that category, and things like that. So uh, Jason Peter moved, I think, outside the defensive end from um, inside mm-hmm. tackle because he had some speed and he had some quickness and things like that when he went to the Panthers. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of things you can do with it um, uh, because you've had that experience of standing up before. So you kind of, you kind of guys really paid attention to, to a lot more de- attention to you that you've been able to do both things. It's kind of like a quarterback doesn't, he doesn't ever get under the center nowadays. And some of them that do both, I think, you know, that that's a big help to them if they do both when they go to the NFL. Well, so there's all kinds of little things that, you know, that, that made an advantage. The one thing we did was if you can look at it, you take your front and you had three basic linemen, two outside backers with their, with their 5-2 defense. Uh, and uh, now you're going to take one lineman out and put one speed guy in. So you're already making your team faster. Well, and so that, that's kind of what happened. We, we took our two um, guys that were really physical people, uh, put our nose was a bit stronger, tougher, you know, we real strong guy, and our tackles were usually more athletic and things like that. And, and then, of course, the outside backers, that's what they were. And... Um, a lot of our linebackers, especially the Will, we we looked for strong safeties and the and defensive backs that were had a little physical ability and but we weren't and we weren't sitting there saying they got to be two thirty or two forty. They could be one hundred ninety five pounds, to, you know, on two hundred pounds and play. All about holding up, and you guys had a bunch of dudes that held up against the run, and that speed and athleticism, a big difference off the edge. Coach, I'm guessing it's about 75 and sunny where you're at. I will uh, let you know if and when it warms up up here, but a lot of fun to talk with you today, and we'll, we'll uh, get caught up with you, with you again next Monday, all right? Good. Okay, I hope the phones are working better. Out here, they drop, so you have to be careful. <laughs> careful. I mean, they, they they don't have as good a connections out here as we have back there. No, you're because good. We're out in the we're in the boonies out. We're we're in we're in the Phoenix area in Scottsdale, mm-hmm. but we're we are in the horse ranch country. Oh well, that's good. Coach, enjoy. You take care. Thanks for the time, yeah. sir. Okay, thanks for having me. Talk to you later. And now, and now back to Hale Varsity Radio. Back into it, it's Hale Varsity Radio tournament time. 
I, uh, I don't have my dancing shoes on, not even for the NIT. We're still a little frustrated about that with Nebraska. Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal, Connor Clark. We welcome in Hall of Fame basketball coach, four teams to the NCAA tournament, three double-digit seeds to the round of the Sweet 16. Tom Pender's back with us. Coach, uh, do you have your dancing shoes on? How you doing? Hey, Chris. Great time of year for every basketball fan in America. It is. It is. And so much to to dive into. I want to go big picture, Big Ten with you to start before we whittle down to get your final four. And what's your impression of the Big Ten this year? Eight teams in, Purdue a one seed, obviously, but a lot of, you know, anywhere between four and seven seeds and, and a few higher tier seeds. What'd you think of the league? Well, I thought it was, you know, there's a lot of hype all year long. Uh, and, and been a lot of teams faded down the stretch. And when a 10 seed, a Penn state can get to the finals of the tournament. It's an indication that the league wasn't as strong as what was projected. You know, it's like, Teams like Michigan State kind of leveled off in, in February and played win one, lose one. They couldn't win on the road. They got stuck in the mud. You know, they. I watched them very closely. And, you know, they get down 10 with two minutes left and let the other team dribble out the clock, which, you know, I don't know. Uh, I, I never, I never did that, and <laughs> I, know, I don't believe it. I know in you that. didn't. <laughs> I've seen a lot of games turn around in the last minute and a half. I remember a, a comeback against a very good DePaul team in 1990. That was Joey Myers' best team. But we were down 12 with less than a minute left, and we hit, you know, four threes. And one in overtime. It's, you know, there's a lot that can happen. And that's what this tournament is about. And I, I, I know I stress this every year. The teams that hit the threes can move on. If you don't defend the threes, you're going to get beat. And that's where the quote upsets happen. I, you know, there are some teams that, have been bowing out early, fairly consistently for their lack of being able to defend the three, despite what their defensive stats say all year long. You know, a lot of the stats, some of these power five teams are built up because they never leave home. And they, you know, they they play eight guarantee games and, those are wins, and those are games where everybody builds up their stats. But, you know, that stuff doesn't matter in March. It's an entirely different season, and it's all about March. Coaches are judged based on what they do in March now, not November, even though the committee, you know, says that every game is just as important, which I vehemently disagree with. Uh, there's no comparison between – a lot of great teams over the years and how they're playing in March and how they started the season. You know, it's ridiculous to think that November counts as much as as late February and March. That's when the the pedal hits the metal. Mm -hmm. Tom Penders is with us here on Hale Varsity Radio. And Coach, you've been a guy who's led some some uh, double digit seeded teams uh, into uh, Sweet Sixteen runs, as Schmitty said, leading off this interview. And I want to get your take. If you were taking over a team, say today, ahead of a, a NCAA tournament run, what's the one quality you'd be looking for within that team to determine if if they're going to make a deep run into this tournament or not? Basically, what I did is Rhode Island, Texas, George Washington, and Houston did. Dial a play, pick up the tempo, shoot the threes, attack the offensive glass, and dare the other team to run with you. Uh, that's been the secret at Iowa for Fran McCaffrey. 
Uh, that's the only reason they've been a top 25 level program uh, in the last, I don't know, five or six years. Uh, and, you know, they don't have a great recruiting base. But that's why kids come there to play for Iowa. You, style of play is what fills up arenas. Of course, you, you know, you have to win with it. But, you know, today, particularly with this ridiculous transfer portal, you know, you can, you can put a team together in six months, kind of like what Chris Beard did at Texas. Mm. Everybody said, well, where is this guy from and that guy? Well, Chris Beard built the culture, built up the new Moody Center before they ever played a game, and they, everybody thought he played too slow at Texas Tech. Well, that was, you know, the way he had to play with the talent he had. And it was about just winning at Texas Tech that filled their arena. But at Texas, after his first year and he got depth and some athletes, he turned it up a notch. And they've been on cruise control you know, since December, now they had their, their ups and downs, uh, but they're they're peaking at the right time. My only hope for them is that they didn't peak too soon, because momentum can change in a hurry in March. Coach Tom Penders is with us on Hale Varsity Radio. Coach, I want to go back to the Big Ten here for a second because you said something about how teams that can shoot the three can get far in this tournament. Penn State is one of those teams that has shot the three pretty well this year. How far do you see them going? Because they have a tough first-round game with what I believe to be an under-seeded Texas A&M team. Yeah, well, Texas A&M has all the motivation in that game. You know, this is Penn State's first ride in the rodeo. And, you know, I'm not sure how the kids are going to respond to it. And they may be too happy with what they did in the Big Ten tournament. I like angry teams in the tournament. Or teams that have something to prove. They didn't get the respect from the committee they deserved. And I know that Texas A&M wants to play Texas badly. I don't know if it's that way the other way around. <laughs> uh, because they had their differences. And that's kind of what broke up the Big 12 and sent A&M to the SEC. And I don't think that's over with in their eyes. You know, they see Texas on television all the time. The Big 12 got a lot more publicity and maybe deservedly so this year, but the SEC is a great league with some really difficult home courts to play on for the road teams. And a and finished second in a great league. Kind of like being in the top three in the in the Big Twelve, uh, so you know I, I think that's an interesting matchup. And I, if I was Texas, I'd rather be a three seed, you know, playing somebody else uh, somewhere closer to home. You know that they're, they're up in the you know upper Midwest, I believe. I forgot where they are, Des Moines. I think so. Yeah, yeah, I think they landed Des Moines. Yeah, they're in Des Moines, not too far from you guys. And that's, you know, not, not a great area for them or for their fans to travel to. So that's also important. As you know, if you study these games and if you've been at these you know, tournament games, the, the fans that bought those tickets beforehand always root for the underdog. So that'll give Penn State an edge in the first game in terms of fan support. And then the second game, uh, that place will be all for the Aggies, in my opinion. Uh, just the way it goes. It doesn't matter what conference you're from. Uh, there, you know, there's no love lost between conference schools. You know, I know growing up in the Big East territory and playing at UConn, UConn was hated by the teams that they that we dominated when I played. We were hated by everybody else. Nobody was rooting for us, you know, from our same conference or from our same area. 
And that's the way it still is today. Coach, there is some storylines beyond the teams, and there's some storylines right now in basketball I want your take on. First, Coach Oates and how he's handled things at Alabama with Brandon Miller. Bama's the top over overall seed, and uh, that's been a, a very tough situation. Also, Chris Beard. I know you're close with Texas and Coach Beard. He got hired today at Ole Miss after uh, charges were dropped uh, that were against him uh, early this season. So comment on both of those situations if you feel like. Yeah, sure. I mean, I was commenting when the whole thing kind of blew up. It's, uh, you know, I, I'm very friendly with Chris Del Conte, the athletic director, and he's under tremendous pressure at Texas. There's a lot of politics involved there, and you know, it's a, it's a, it's a different time in many big universities around the country. And you're guilty until proven innocent in this world today. Hopefully that changes and we get back to being the real America. Uh, You can be accused of anything today. And coaches being public people, you know, the whole thing was really, you know, unfortunate. Uh, I know from Chris what the real details are. I was confident uh, the charges would have been dropped, and would be dropped, and they were. You know, I kind of wish that Texas was a little more patient and waited for everything to be played out in the courts or in, with, with the law. But, you know, they chose the direction to go, and I'm, I'm not sure if it was Chris Del Conte's decision or people above him, some board of regents. It's, it's, you know, it's, a, it's always been a political school. You know, it's, it's, a, it's the capital, and it's a huge state, and, you know, it happened. I think Old Miss is very lucky to have Chris Beard. I think he'll turn them around immediately. He'll have them in the tournament in year one, and in year two, look out. They'll make a serious run at the SEC and in the NCAA tournament. He's a great coach. And now. And now, back to Hale Varsity Radio. Tom Pender's few minutes with his stalking uh, NCAA tournament, Hale Varsity Radio. Follow Coach on Twitter at Tom Penders. Coach, what about Alabama and Coach Oates with how he's handled Brandon Miller? Yeah, I have no problem second-guessing him. Mm -hmm. Uh, because, you know, to me, it's a murder. A murder of a young woman, uh, a girlfriend of Miles, and all that. There's no question about the involvement. You know, with with no gun, there's no shooting. And Brandon Miller made a huge mistake. I don't know what he was thinking you don't loan somebody a weapon. You shouldn't loan anybody a car, never mind a weapon, because a car can become a weapon and ruin your life as well as others. So I think they should have suspended him. You don't worry about ruining your one seed. As a matter of fact, I think if he served a three, two, three-game suspension, everybody would have been happy with it. But I, I think NATO's didn't handle it right. I don't think the athletic director of Alabama handled it right. I don't think the university handled it right. We'll see how, you know, the rest of the world, you know, handles this whole thing through through the tournament. They're they're not unbeatable. I mean, my UConn Huskies, you know, handled. Alabama when they were playing really well early in the season when both teams were playing well they're beatable you just have to defend the three you don't have to worry about Brandon Miller beating you it's about what your team does against their team if you defend their three make them score twos all night 
and hit some threes on your own, they can be beaten. And, you know, I, I'm not sure it's going to happen in the first weekend, but they're going to face somebody that's going to figure it out. It's like, you know, it's like Iowa uh, and Penn State figuring out how to beat Purdue. Well, you make Edie come out and, and play ball screens defensively, or you use his man to set screens uh, to let the ball handler have open 15-footers all day or three-pointers, that's how you beat him. You make him play defense. You make him run up and down the floor, uh, not play half-court basketball. And that's the formula to beat Purdue. Everybody's got a weakness today. You know, I, I, I coached mostly in an era where, you know, even Shaquille O'Neal stayed three years. Danny Manning, four years, et cetera, et cetera. Now it's the one and done wonders, and anything can happen. It, you know, it's, just, it's no surprise. And the first weekend is going to be just as exciting as ever. That's what makes the tournament great. People watch to see the upset. And, you know, the tournament is going to be filled again this weekend with upsets. It's the second weekend that becomes more predictable because everybody knows who's on what team, what style is played. Uh, you know, St. Peter's is an example last year. You know, they struggled in their own conference. Uh, and that's where I own a conference. Uh, you know, they can beat anybody. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Rick Pitino's a damn good coach. And, you know, UConn's got to get by them before they can go anywhere. The only thing there in that game is Iona's style is exactly what UConn wants to play. And you've got to be able to slow UConn down and really get into their point guards and, and keep them off the boards. So there are a lot of things you have to do to beat UConn. Coach, before we get you out of here, let's get into the nitty-gritty. I need, first off, a team that you like to maybe make a Cinderella-type run this season, and then following that, I need your uh, your four Final Four teams this year. I, I'm sticking with Houston. You know, they play great defense. If Sasser's healthy, their starting backcourt is as good a tandem as there is in college basketball. And... Kelvin Sampson's going to figure out ways to beat you. He knows, he knows how to ride different horses in this race. He did it at Oklahoma. He did it at Washington State. He did it at Indiana. And, you know, he's doing it at the University of Houston, too. And, you know, he's a great coach. And he and Bill Self are kind of the, the two best in college basketball you should never bet against anyone, uh, the, the coaches at that level. And those that don't believe that just have to look and see what happened to Kansas this weekend. So, you know, they're one of my favorite teams to follow. I just hope that Bill's in you know, good enough health, you know, that he can coach his normal style and be on top of things the way he's Nobody's better at making adjustments than Bill. But this is also the weakest team I've seen them have at Kansas since Bill Self has taken over. There's no big man. Uh, their guards are, are good. They're solid. They probably have one future pro on that team where Bill usually has three or four guys on that team. So, you know, they, I can't say they should be a number one, you know, the, the number one seed. I think Alabama has a pretty easy route to the Elite Eight. Uh, and then we'll see, you know, who they're going to face. Probably it'll be Arizona. And Arizona has the ability, you know, to neutralize Alabama, to defend Alabama, and make Alabama play defense. That's also a key to beating Alabama. Purdue, again, it's about matchups. When they run into a, 
a smart coach is going to make Edie play defense, <laughs> I think they're going to struggle. They cannot play defense the way Matt Painter's teams usually do, but he's a great rim protector, obviously. He's seven four. You know, he's very agile, but he's slow footed and he has problems. You know, that's that spells foul trouble right off the bat. But I, I'm struggling. Marquette is who I'm rooting for because I've been a Shaka smart fan since his Virginia Commonwealth days, and they're playing extremely well, and I don't think things are going to change in the tournament. He's got a very mature team. They play for each other. So I'll pick Marquette to come out of that region. You know, if Bill, uh, Bill Self is healthy, I wouldn't bet against him. Mm -hmm. But I think they have a very dangerous opponent in game two if it's the Arkansas Razorbacks. They're ticked off uh, with their performance and the way their last game ended. And that's how you want a team to come into this tournament. I'll still... If, if, if you point the gun in my head, I'm picking Kansas to come out of that region. So that's my final four. I like it. Tom Penders with his coach. We'll check in with you around Sweet 16 time. Thank you so much for the insight and the takes. Always great to talk some uh, March Madness with you, sir. And now. And now, back to Hale Varsity Radio. Big thanks for uh, all the guests today. Tom Penders, you just heard. Good stuff from Charlie McBride and Coach Michael Huffman. From Bell West, before he heads off to spring break, his reaction to Daniel Kalen committing to Missouri and just his interactions with not only uh, Coach Rule, but cookies from uh, Mama Huffman uh, for Coach Rule. That story was great. Which was great. Uh, podcast, Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, where you can go to find out uh, – all parts of the show, uh, some of us and some of the, the guests, or just the the full show to take with you, and uh, the stream up for you uh, with the uh, Hale Varsity YouTube channel. Also, can rewatch the show or listen Hale Varsity Radio at H Varsity Radio to to watch it live or just check the replay out. So, spring football a week from today, we'll get. Heavy into it. We'll spend the rest of the week talking some spring preview with some of the position groups. Mitch Sherman going to join us tomorrow. Mitch, excellent work uh, on uh, linebacker Fields from Oklahoma. Really good story from the Athletic on Fields. That's a guy I love since it was announced that he was taking a visit to Nebraska. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that Mitch hit on in his story, which I'm sure we're going to talk about yesterday, was just the fact of man, how did this guy fly under the radar? Because that's the first thought I had whenever I watched his film. How is this guy, how is his top offer Arkansas State? Didn't quite seem to make sense. Mitch kind of dove into that. Yeah, it's where you envision him playing. What's his mentality and what's his ability? What's that link like? And Nebraska's like, man, we like you at linebacker. And Fields is like, good, because I like playing linebacker and I like hitting people. So we'll talk to Mitch Sherman tomorrow. Uh, the different perspective on the NCAA tournament with Andy Markowski tomorrow as Andy will join us, get his take on the tournament. Of course, the WNIT with Nebraska in action here later on in the week. Bill Bender going to join us from the Sporting News and then uh, busy back at it Thursday and Friday to get your tournament kicked off and excited for that. So we'll uh, probably spend some time on the quarterback spot tomorrow. And, uh, Connor, you were geared up to do baseball, man, but that's got moved down to the Little Apple, it looks like. That's what we get for playing baseball in March in the state of Nebraska, right? Because <laughs> Wait till it, you're a parent if you settle here and the uh, the hell that is spring in Nebraska. Oh, I mean, you could ask my parents. They had to go through it when I was in Little League out, out in old Chi-Town. I know it's not as, you know, bad sometimes, but it's it's pretty similar. But, I mean... It's supposed to be, what, 63 on Wednesday mm -hmm. and then 30 
over the yeah, weekend. Yeah. It'll it'll flip. It's, it makes no sense. It, it is Nebraska. <laughs> it makes no sense. It is Nebraska. That's Figuring might be out, the most accurate thing we've ever said on this show. <laughs> figuring out the weather in this state might be tougher than figuring out who I want to pick for my final four this year. Well, I'm not even kidding. We're going to make the decision. Uh, it is going to be a bottle of Tito's for the for the winner. Winner. Can we do a bottle of Jack? <laughs> How about how about winner's choice? Winner's choice. Yeah, uh, I, I under what's what's the price limit on the under? Keep in mind, guys, I'm in college. That's what I'm saying. Boo hoo. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'll just have to not lose. <laughs> yeah, Connor's already calling a shot, putting himself as a favorite for the tournament. Yeah, I'll be taking a bottle of Don Julio. Thank you very much, Connor Clark. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got to be confident somehow, forget right? Forget the John Daniels. Uh, there we go. Uh, thanks for spending time. Thanks for tuning in to Hale Varsity. Back tomorrow at 4. Hale Varsity Radio presented by Currency. For all your equipment financing needs, go Currency, Chris Schmidt, uh, Elijah Herbal, Connor Clark. Talk to you tomorrow at 4. Thanks for tuning in.